All right. Well, um, I thought we'd do, I, I'll just give a quick update on um, uh, the calculations that Mike and I and others are doing. So on Monday, we were able to take um, the setting that, that John Power outlines of um, the V enriched uh, Yoneda lemma. And um, apply it so that the container logic is um, whatever the, the 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 V category is. So um, the example that we ran was where the category was is the category of the, the V category was a category of Hilbert spaces. And we do indeed get the container logic being um, the kinds of operations that you find on Hilbert spaces. Um, for those who are a little less familiar, uh, um, Hilbert spaces are special kinds of vector spaces. Uh, that are typically used as the beginning of um, uh, quantum mechanics. So if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, do a presentation of um, quantum mechanics, it's uh, a, a lot of the uh, early treatments are inside Hilbert spaces. So. Um, they're just vector spaces with some extra, extra stuff, extra structure. So, um, and can, can I ask you? Go ahead. Is is a, a, a Hilbert space a, a Euclidean space without a parallel uh, axiom? No, no. no. Uh, the, the the main thing is you've got a. Um, uh, you've got a vector space with certain kinds of um, uh, close properties. Um, yeah, I mean, if, you, if you think about it as a vector space, that's 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 what's necessary. Um, uh, so so anyway, we. Um, We were able to to successfully run the construction, and um, I'm still a little uh, uh, I don't know how to put it. There's a there's a um, there's a notion of sub object that I want to pin down that I don't believe is the same as as what's going on with um, uh, the notion of sub that's traditionally identified by collections of monomorphisms. Um, so I'm still unhappy or uncomfortable with that, but um, we, uh, we are able to, uh, to, you know, essentially do the trick that, that I wanted, um, which is to make the, to identify the place where the container logic is coming into play. So the, the next uh, calculation that I want to do in that setting is um, to, um, <clears throat> to run uh, um, when the container is um, uh, a probability distribution. Uh, more, more precisely, um, there's a thing called the Geary monad. Um, which gives you a notion of probability. And then Hanengaden sort of refactors the Geary monad or tweaks the Geary monad a little bit. Um, so I want to run that as the container logic. And the idea is to get the container logic to uh, end up being 
um, uh, conditional probabilities. Since we'll have a notion of arrow, we should have a notion of conditional probabilities. Um, so we'll see if that works out um, or if conditional probability is still more subtle. Um, but that's, uh, that's basically the, the thing that we're going to go after um, uh, in some of our subsequent calculations. Uh, does that make sense? It's hard to say, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, looking, I was, I was searching at, uh, at Gary Monad and uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the, 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 main, the main thing is it's just like, you know, you're, you, you, uh, as I've tried to say, you want to be able to have kind of design level thinking. You know, like when you're designing stuff, you, you know that you don't have all the details, right? You're, you're still kind of at the design phase and eventually you'll get down to, you'll get down to the, to the details, right? And so the, the whole point, in, in some sense, the whole point of, of this research is, is to give you um, a framework in which you can design your logic, right? You, you, you wanna be able to say, I need a logic that does you know, X, Y, and Z, right? And so you, you can build it out of the components, right? So. So the, the argument that I've made is that a logic has, you know, um, a small number of components, right? So it's got a notion of a container. It's got a notion of the, uh, the constructors for the domain of things that it's reasoning over, right? So that would be the term language. Uh, and, then, and then potentially it has a notion of the behavior in addition to the structure, uh, the behavior of the things, that, the domain of discourse that you're reasoning over. Right, so those are the three things. And so in, in this case, I'm focused on the container part, right? Is my container a Hilbert space? Is my container, you know, um, a set? Is my container um, um, uh, conditional probabilities, right? What is my container? Mm. And so, so can I ask you, uh, uh, you mentioned, so, so uh, when you say collection and container, do, do you uh, think about the same thing or yeah, those are the same things. Yeah, the collection, mm. the collection logic, the container. The collection is a container, right? It, it contains elements or contains things, whatever they are. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you 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 mentioned uh, graph as uh, your container. So graph is, uh, graph is another one. You want oh, so so now you you are you are switching uh, different containers and uh, you you're trying to see uh, what kind of. Uh, what kind of logic then you can produce? That's correct. That's correct. Mm. Right. And so, 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 so the, the idea is if we get it right, then you can switch out different containers. Right. Before what we were looking at was, you know, did we, uh, what was, what was the minimal structure? And it, you know, it looked like graph was the next thing past set that had the minimal structure, but then, we looked at a little bit more carefully at John Power's construction, and we we observed that we don't have to be quite so strict in our requirements. And so then we were able to look at some of these other uh, some of these other containers, right? And so it, and remember, it goes both ways, right? The the requirements that we have on containers to play a particular role in the logic is also sort of helps us identify a good notion of container. Right? So what we're trying to do is to find effective notions of container that have these logical analogs, right? So you can, you can build the container of all sub components, right? Or the collection of all sub collections. Right, um, that that's the kind of thing that we're uh, that we're looking at here. So basically, uh, basically, uh, the logic that uh, we can generate uh, with some container gives us uh, some kind of feedback. Uh, what, what this container looks like, and what, what I mean, we, we we gain some information, right? That, that's correct. Yeah. So, in other words, the algorithm for generating the logic. You know, it's going to put some type constraints 
on on its inputs. And so there are some typing constraints on things that are are the kinds of containers that will work for the algorithm that generates the logic using it, right? And then we can use that that con constraint those constraints to sort of say, and this is a good notion of container. Why? Oh, well, because, because it helps you it helps you build the logic, right? So hmm. so this, it, this it, go ahead. I mean, it, 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 it seems like uh, recursive in, in that sense. Uh, well, it's not so much recursive as just, you know, it's design level thinking, you know, so on, on the one hand, you know, we have this intuition about how logic works, but that, that, that intuition is informed by how containers work. But then if you flip it around, it's just, it's, it's kind of like mental flexibility. If you just look at it from the other point of view, right? Okay. Well, um, you know, having an algorithm that you know, produces a logic, if it puts constraints on containers um, or collections, then it, you know, then it um, will give you a, it, it will, it will sort of identify collections that are, you know, <laughs> logicable <laughs> or logic, logicifiable, whatever, whatever the right verb is here uh, or, or, or adjective. Um, um, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's the ideas and, um, uh, and, and, and in, and in general, you know, this has kind of been something that I, uh, try to identify is this, does the, the space that allows for design level thinking, right? You want to design your logic, you want to design your type system. In much the same way that you want to design your calculus, right? Your calculus, like you know, the, like with 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 Rolang and the reflective techniques, you know, one of the things that I showed was there's lots and lots of wiggle room, right? There's we've hardly scratched the surface of all the different logics. I'm mean, sorry, a, a calculi that you can generate uh, using the techniques that I identified, and they go well beyond. Uh, just um, just a, a calculi like that, right? And I showed that you can apply the same techniques to set theory, like the very foundations of mathematics up until, you know, the 1960s. Uh, so for several hundred years, right? Um, uh, set theory, uh, but you know, what, what I was able to show is if you, you can apply the reflective techniques to the foundations of mathematics and get new set theories. Right? So that's uh, so the, the 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 main point is again, it's design level thinking. It allows you to to generate um, structures that um, that sort of match your design considerations. Uh, so that's the that's the, the the philosophy or the the approach. Um, and can I ask you more about uh, about this uh, design level thinking? Uh, I mean this. Uh, can, can you say more? I mean, from from from, from the perspective of uh, programming, also. Uh, uh, well, well, one uh, one one approach that you know is sort of uh, has the flavor of design level thinking is domain specific languages, right? So, so you have a you have a particular problem that you want to solve, um, you know, a, a, a domain area. Um, and then, you know, like, like blockchain, and then you, you know, you, you want to design, <coughs> you want to design a smart contracting um, system that, that fits the domain. So first, first and foremost, you do an analysis of the domain. What does the domain need? Right? So if there are heavy scaling constraints, then you want to not consider um, uh, situations where you, where you've got a lot of sequentiality, right? So you wouldn't use Lambda calculus, for example, because you can see that, that it's, it doesn't scale, um, because it's sequential. Um, and, and, uh, you know, you, you look at other, dom others, you know, kinds of things like you, if you need a complexity analysis, 
right? That's going to pick out um, uh, particular kinds of of uh, uh, language characteristics. So you look at your you look at your domain and you figure out sort of what its requirements are, and then you uh, if you if you know how to assemble languages, then you assemble a language um, based upon the requirements associated with the domain or the requirements that you figured it out. So this is kind of the, the trick of, of domain specific languages. So that's design level thinking. You know, you're not trying to shoehorn something like, you don't, you don't pick a particular uh, formalism and, and shoehorn it into the, um, into the situation. What you say, well, what actually needs to, what are the what needs to be solved here? What's the problem we're trying to solve? And then, and then how uh, out of the components that we have at hand, you know, how do we assemble them to uh, to um, to to address those problems? And you're you're looking at it, you know, from, as a design kind of problem, right? So. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, and, and we can have like like uh, this view of uh, uh, where we can we can look from one side and uh, like uh, I, I mean uh, I'm thinking about what you said uh, when you look at the logic how how or what kind of container you want and the uh, other way around. So yeah, exactly. You you want to yeah exactly. You want to look at it um, from multiple different perspectives, right? Um, it's like, you know, when you're doing mathematics, well, how did you know that you got your definitions right? Well, the proofs went through. Okay, well, how do you know you got your proofs right? Well, or, or, yeah. um, because, uh, well, because we were able to get good definitions. <laughs> you, you, you see? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're, you're none. None of them is like a priori the the um, the center of gravity. You're just you're you have a kind of flexibility. You're willing to look at either side or in any any particular constituent as as you know either derived or as found, foundational. I see. Thanks. Thanks for this question. No, it's a great. It's a great question. So, then um, I know that Rao had mentioned he wanted to spend some time in these Casper standups, um, talking about uh, the scaling that we do. So maybe we can do a little bit of planning, um, and uh, and give, um, or maybe do an R cast or something where we. We, we spend a lot of time talking about, uh, you know, the, the kind of um, assays that we've done um, in terms of scaling and how people should look at the data and, and you know, what the explanations of the, the data are. So I think, uh, you know, that would be a, a good thing to start planning for because people are very impressed. Yeah, I agree. I think we need to um, kind of uh, we could use that in a in a neutral uh, comparison to other uh, comments and stuff that was put out there, um, and say you know here is here is why. In fact, the sooner we have it, I would like to send it out as a promo for um, also encouraging people to join the hackathon. I mean, I'll go ahead and do that anyway in a, in a light way now, but. I think that would be useful as we encourage people to develop on the network. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I think it's it. It's going to be a big motivator, right? Um, and uh, so, I mean, the other thing is, you know, um, once we have the last finalized state and we have block merge, then it becomes a completely different economic proposition. For people to stand up nodes, right? Because uh, adding 
adding nodes, at least nodes of a certain capacity, are uh, is going to increase the speed of the network. <laughs> uh, so we have to be we have to be careful because you know if people add um, really slow nodes, or if they add nodes that are behind some you know terrible latency problems. That won't, that won't add anything that will detract from the network, but, um, at least, uh, at least in the, you know, in the case where we can sort of have a, a proof of hardware, <laughs> uh, kind of, uh, exercise, then, um, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And so we'll be able to, to grow the network and people will have, um, at least some, um, economic, uh, some additional economic incentives, right? Which I think will then have a positive effect on, on uh, our SaaS and uh, and you know just the the whole DAP ecosystem in general. Uh, yeah, so, and and then that would bring up also the multi-tiered shards. Like you know, are there? Um, are, <clears throat> if you want to run it off of your laptop, uh, you know, is there a certain shard you would join? versus you have heavy duty hardware and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that uh, that we need to make clear is that um, the block merge that's going on right now is is post the um, uh, the conflicts that happen because everybody goes through the same proof of stake contract. Right. So what were the concurrency that we're getting um, and the, the kinds of conflicts that we're worried about are um, the, they, they have sort of pre factored the, um, the POS infrastructure. Would you agree, Tomislav? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, it's like it's like all of that is has already been accounted for, and now you're looking at the um, uh, the conflicts of the transactions in the in the blocks um, uh, in in and of them in, in and of themselves. But you know that all the all the charging infrastructure conflicts is is sort of. Uh, uh, it's like we've factored that out, right? That's already taken care of. We've already addressed that. And so the 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 one way to think about, you know, um, the speed up here versus the speed up in sharding, when you do a shard, you're avoiding that conflict, right? So right now there's, there's um, when you charge, everything has to go through the charging infrastructure. So those a set of conflicts there and then inside a the block there's conflicts there um so you um so when you shard you're you're um separating out the charging infrastructure right the, the your your iso your your isolating transactions um to one charging infrastructure or another charging infrastructure sh sharding infrastructure charging infrastructure sorry um <laughs> that's hilarious um um uh so 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 th that's so that's at like at a different level in the system um so if you have two shards they will have different charging infrastructure um and you'll be able to um, um, allow those transactions to go without conflict, right? And then inside the blocks, you have additional opportunities for, for concurrency. Does that make sense? I, I don't think I've explained yeah, it very well. Yes, can, can, uh, and uh, now, now I'm thinking if we have uh, multiple staking tokens, this can be very similar or but that's just a, that's what's happening, right? When you have a separate shard, mm -hmm. you have a separate staking token. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yes, this makes sense. Right, and then um, and then when you uh, and then when you when you wire the the shards together, then the the staking tokens get 
you know, wired into a particular ar arrangement of, of um, you know, a a additional uh, uh, coordination infrastructure, right? So, um, you know, one one token becomes the backing token for another token, or they're they're siblings of a parent that is backing both of them. Um, but that's the so so the the so this this is uh, you know in, in part why even if ethereum even with sharding is not going to do it right because they're only they're only doing one source of conflict right we're we're looking at both sources of conflict right you have you have conflict within particular transactions and the way they address that is every transaction runs to completion right so they don't have they don't have any parallelism in that part but what what we can show is that you know, if you have parallelism at that level, you get significant network um, uh, performance improvement. And then, you know, both Ethereum and our chain have sharding, which is is to address the conflicts at the at the level of the charging infrastructure. So that's uh, um, that's um, you know essentially what what's going on, and we'll need to. I need to work on the language, but, but, you know, we need to be able to, you know, uh, illustrate that, um, both graphically and, and with the uh, linguistic descriptions. And I think, I think people will get what's going on there. Now, um, if you have multiple shards, does that require to be, um, to be a separate token or can it be, um, can you still run on the same token, but the accounting issues are um, reduced to that short only? Um, uh, at, at least in terms of our version of Casper, they are separate tokens and they become wired together uh, if they are either in placed in a parent child relationship or placed in a you know, sibling relationship beneath a parent. Got it. Okay. Uh, I, I was thinking about sharding, and uh, one idea uh, 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 that I was thinking is uh, if if we have if we if we generate if we if we can use uh, multiple uh, random uh, uh, random generators with with, uh, with different seeds, we can basically have or in one node uh, multiple. Uh, like multiple tuple spaces that, that are, are like almost the same in the same language, but uh, uh, they are really different. They're, they're not sharing the same uh, unforgeable names. Yes, that's correct. Uh, so, what what this means? <laughs> uh, that, that that's that's namespaces. That is that is a namespace. Mm. That's your that's the coarsest level of a namespace, right? Oh, this, I, I see. Yeah. So we are we are now working only on one name, namespace basically, but uh, one namespace. That's right. Oh, I see. And uh, uh, do you see some use of having oh, yeah. multiple namespaces and how? Oh, t totally. <laughs> <laughs> totally right. I mean, this is another way of slicing and dicing, right? You know that yeah. between two, you know that there is no conflict from one namespace to like. Across namespaces, yeah, can't be a conflict you know, because they, they don't share any names. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so then, does that also give us a performance advantage or scaling advantage that way? Yes, it does. Yeah. But but the 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 the, the point is that we now have a, a crisp, clear characterization of um of the major sources of um, uh, performance problems, right? Because, because we've organized everything in terms of communication over names, <laughs> we can identify um, all of the major sources of performance issues, right? Most um, uh, engineering efforts in this space and, and in general struggle to give crisp care, uh, um, characterizations of all the performance issues. Right? They, you know, that if you think if you think about it, 
just in terms of engineering on the JVM. In, in um, all the JVM languages, there's no way to tell just by looking at the code how many threads run through the code. So what chance do you have to really reason about um, conflict or performance problems, performance challenges? It's a, it's a, it becomes like this black art. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing this right now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you, you know the pain that I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you can try and see and try again and see and try. And, and exactly. I, I don't see right. better way. <laughs> right. But, 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 you know, within within the architecture that we've set up right we we can we we know exactly where the sources of of um of, of performance challenges are you know you know the anytime you have contention for resources and there's a, uh, you know you have a performance challenge and and you can identify all contentions for resources the syntactically <laughs> you're 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 uh, it's like with, with with the with the jvm languages or threading or these kinds of things there's there's no way syntactically to identify contentions for resources so that's that 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 makes all the difference right we, we can we can now employ you know, computer programs to help us identify where all the contentions and the resources are because it's now just a matter of searching the syntax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we, we need different uh, debuggers. Yes. Oh, Which... well, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, and I, I've, I've thought a lot about uh, uh, the, you know, debugging in a, in a row and pie like setting. It's, it's uh, it's hard. <laughs> uh, it, it, I, I would like to hear what you, what ideas you have because uh, I'm I'm also not sure how to really uh, design these debuggers because they're like on, on, on another level uh, uh, and I I can imagine that uh, with these tools we will design different kind of software. Not, we are we are now like in, in kindergarten and. We will design like much, much more complex stuff. Yeah, which are, no, now it's almost yeah. not possible. You're you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I mean, the the the, the issue is that there's this um, worldview that somehow you've got one focus. Like the existing debuggers, they're not really thread aware, and because they're not really thread aware you have this issue of context switching or, or changing the focus. It's just like when you're on your machine and some other window grabs the focus, right? It's like, how often is that useful? <laughs> yeah. It's not. In, in like 99% of the cases, it's not useful. The only time it's really useful is if it's an urgent situation, right? The, this interruption is more important than anything else. And so we're going to grab the focus. But in, in general, um, you know, if if you've got multiple threads and all of them are of, of the same relative importance, um, grabbing the focus is not a good idea. And that's because the idea of, of focus is wrong, right? Um, yes. a, a better, uh, you know, one way to think about it is, you know, like if you're playing the drums, right? So you've got, you know, a stick in each hand and 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 you've got, you know, one foot controlling the hi-hat and the other foot controlling the the kick for the bass drum, right? No one of your limbs is the focus. They're, they're coordinated yeah. together. The music is the focus, right? And, and so all, you know, all the threads that are being, you know, handled by, by those four limbs, that, that's really the, the view that you want to provide is, is this more whole view, right? Yeah, that yeah. yeah. Um, the, the stopping the drummer in, in some position uh, with, that, that doesn't give you any information, right? You will see one one uh, hand in, in the air, 
uh, one yeah. foot uh, in, in, in what? <laughs> what is the music? Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It can be exactly anything. Right. And that, even that. worse, if 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 uh, uh, only one uh, hand uh, is stopped and all, all the other continue, right? Well, then it's t- total mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so this is the kind of uh, th- this is the kind of shift that we have to make for. Uh, in in order to have a, a good view of these multi-threaded systems this you know being able to see the being able to see the song as a whole <laughs> yeah. uh, you know and and it's interesting because you know people people like I made a study of uh, all the different concurrency systems um, where people handle concurrency without a problem Um, you know, so like music is a place where people handle concurrency without a problem. Driving, right? When you drive stick shift, you know, people are, are you know, you know, listening to the sound of the engine. They're, they're you know, shifting. They're working the clutch and the brake and the gas um, and the steering wheel. All, all, you know, that's a situation where people are, you know, you know, they, you know, you know, whatever, a 14 year old absorbs the basic principles. And by the time they're 20, they're a very competent uh, uh, driver and are, are, and are able to, at least on some level, I mean, they may not have the best judgment in the world, but, but in, in terms of the skill set, they're, they, they, they're quite competent, right? So it's a very small amount of training uh, to come up to speed, to be able to um, operate, you know, even mission critical systems, like, you know, being on a, In a, in a car on a freeway um, <coughs> so and, 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 and similarly and another another place where you know you can you can see the parallelism at, in action is when children read comics right because it's graphical they're not necessarily just reading according to the you know uh, some particular narrative flow they can they can they can spy a whole page and the whole page has multiple panels on it and um, they can take in, you know, more than uh, more than one panel at a time. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole set of concurrency rules that happen inside comics. That's also uh, uh, quite intriguing. Uh, so there's lots and lots of um, evidence that we're, we're very good at, um, at concurrency. And being able to um, uh, being able to to uh, when you want to design a debugger, um, what you're what you're trying to do is to to you know make it uh, as simple as a comic, right? Like when you had a hand a comic to an eight year old, you don't give the eight year old a rule book like how to read comics. Right? They just they just pick up and start reading and, and you know and they figure it out within seconds as to how um, you know h- how you know what's going on and how to read them. Uh, so it's the same thing with the debugger. You wanna you, you wanna give a view of the system where you don't have to say and how do you read this? Right? Here here's the technical manual for <laughs> for reading this. Well, one um, one. You know, I, I think, you know, the, the DAG view that we've come up with, which is an, uh, a, a variant of the ping pong diagrams, uh, that, that view has a, has a lot of explanatory power. So that's uh, uh, something that we, we might want to look at. The, prob- the problem with the ping pong diagrams in general is no branching. Right. And once you int- once you introduce um, conditional branching, that makes those diagrams very complicated and hard to read. Um, yeah, I, I, go ahead. I, I, I was thinking, uh, for example, uh, when uh, when we are executing rolling, we can in debugger, maybe we can have uh, like view uh, like executing the whole the whole rolling code and uh, and this will be like one way of if we, if we have a branching inside the inside the scope we can have, we can see one branch and then we can pick uh, 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 one of these branches and say okay but from this branch uh, pick another and then we, we see uh, a complete execution in in, in this situation and uh, if we can switch between branches 
uh, that, that can give us like you know instantaneous information about the whole execution so this yeah. is also one way of yeah yeah that that is one way but but notice that if you want to compare executions between two branches you have to keep one in memory and one in your eyes and the thing the thing that's really um like we've got millions of years of uh, evolution into the geometric processing in our uh, visual system. So the extent to which we can utilize that processor to its maximum capability, the better. So you want to offload. This is this is what I've been saying so much about. Like, um, like the syntax needs to support stuff. Like when when someone reads Java code. They have to keep in the back of their mind the state of the VM because the code doesn't have everything you need in order to see how it's going to execute. Whereas with Lambda Calculus or Pi Calculus or Rho Calculus or any of the things that are designed like that, there's nothing you have to keep in the back of your mind. It's all in the syntax. And so your eyes are doing so much more processing for you, right? Um, so the same thing is true about this uh, about branching, if you can find a way to diag diagrammatically present the branching so that you can compare them side by side, you'll be able to um, access the, the 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 power of the visual processor. That's the, that's the the trick. Uh, it's like you ha you you want to turn um, uh, possibility into geometry. Uh, now, tying this uh, debugger's conversation back to namespaces, um, if we have multiple namespaces, how does the DAG then look? We're looking at a DAG within the namespace, or are we? Um, is that Still, going to help with the debugging or uh, with simple, simplifying the debugging or not? So what will happen is you, you'll get no... Um, like the, the, the simplest thing is there's no blocks in one namespace refer to blocks in an, another namespace. Now you can build structure above that so that, so that you do get references, but that's more like a tree or something like that. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It's like in, in a given namespace, all the transactions are built off of, like you can't have a transaction that um, crosses the two, or if you do, then you have to have a, a different kind of um, uh, consensus infrastructure, right? Which is what the sharding stuff does, mm -hmm. right? So you, th you think about, uh, um, but but it, it also it's a little bit orthogonal in the sense that you you could insist that you know this validator group will uh you know this shard works on namespace x y and z right and so and then once they you know and it could be more than just a finite list but the for purposes of discussion let's just say that the you know, there's some finite number of namespaces that they're working on and they advertise what namespaces they're working on um, and then they they are able to figure out, okay, you know, um, this block is only touching namespaces X and Y, but not Z. Um, and so there's no potential conflict with any transactions that are associated with Z. So we can always merge Z transactions into this into this block. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so once once you have that, uh, once you have that, so I guess the, the the point I'm trying to make is that they're a little bit orthogonal, but you can you can make up certain disciplines, right? So you can you can say, um, well, just think about it in terms of URLs, right? So so now now we can d describe, uh, you know. With with a, a URL kind uh, like language, with a path like language that describes the structure of names, we can now say, you know, uh, this shard 
you know, handles all the paths below, you know, this, all the names below this path, right? Um, and and then this this shard handles all the names below this other path, and so uh, so 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 that way you've got you've got um, uh, how do I say it? you've got you've got like high level dispatching. You, you know that you know you're routing these names over here and those names over there uh and and you you, you see what i'm what i'm yeah, yeah. So basically you're saying the namespaces can be an organization structure about the shards is probably the more uh, um i guess more useful um, way to think about them no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What, I, what I'm saying is um, that the, the namespace structure is orthogonal to uh, to the transactional structure in a certain way, uh, or not the transactional, but to the sharding. How you slice and dice your transactions can utilize the namespace structure, right? But it's not, it's not, um, uh, but, but you, you have a, a lot of different possible designs that you can you can uh, cover, so you can yeah. so you, okay. you can utilize uh, the the namespace structure to do high level dispatching. You know, shard one, shard two, shard three, and then you use the namespace structure inside a shard to 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 do you know further dispatching. So it's compositional is the point. Right, right. So that that, that can be um, uh, using that way. I mean, basically, you use namespace wherever you can to simplify things. I guess is the better way to do it. Um, at whatever level. Now, I guess what I'm curious about is where are the other networks relative to supporting namespaces? They don't even have the idea. I see. And that, 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 they're, they're still tied to, you know, um, SHA and these other kinds of cryptographic um, view of of names. They haven't recognized that, that that names are really structured. It, 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 kind of where we are technologically is sort of where we were uh, historically uh, twenty years ago, right? So it was literally in two thousand two that I had the insight. Oh no. Na names uh, names have to be structured, right? And and therein began a dialogue, right? So even even by two thousand five, I was having conversations with Robin where where he was um, he was still very worried about names having structure, right? So so the pi calculus he makes he thinks he's making no assertions about the structure of names, but you can prove that that's not true. I mean, in, in, in PyCalculus, uh, uh, I was thinking that uh, uh, the names, the, the names are, are like uh, natural numbers. Uh, uh, and they're, they're, yeah, they're like natural numbers in the sense mm -hmm. that they, they are at least countably infinite. Mm -hmm. And you have to have an effective equality, mm -hmm. but 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 you see the, the point is what Girdle showed is that if you can sneak in the natural numbers, you snuck in all of computing. Oh, I see. Right, that's kind of the whole. That's the the, the real moral. That's the takeaway of of Girdle's work. Is it like. You, you know, <laughs> well, you know, I, I actually snuck in the natural numbers and then through girdle numbering, I can now make sentences talk about themselves. And <laughs> yeah. I, I was thinking that uh, 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 starting with, uh, with the monoid, uh, uh, natural numbers can be constructed. So I, I was thinking that uh, uh, when you have a, a, a raw calculus, you can use names just by using the monoids uh, terms from the raw calculus, and uh, and uh, and uh, and you uh, uh, added the full language to be the names. Uh, so, so so well, no, it's what the, the real. It's not just that I. Um, what I said was something slightly different. What I said was, 
because um, because even even by the late 90s robin was starting to look at naming monoids right so he was he was starting to go okay all right well what if they were a monoid then what <laughs> and you have to understand that robin was robin was was heavily influenced by all of the errors that arose from pointer manipulation right so he was worried that if you introduced a structure on names then you would get this kind of pointer manipulation problem right? so that's that's because yeah, I mean, like you know, if you do like fancy pointer manipulation in C, things go really wrong, <laughs> very quickly, <laughs> right? And so he he was he was worried about that, and um, but 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 what I showed, what I argued with him, and what I showed convincingly is that as soon as you have, a, a, you have to have at least a structure of the natural numbers. So it's not just the monoid, right? It's actually the monoid of the natural numbers. Um, and as soon as you have that, then it's like you've already snuck in something that is at least as powerful as your term language. And as soon as you've done that, right, then you have then you haven't done a foundational account, right? What Robin was trying to do was to give a foundational account of concurrency. But if his foundations actually depends upon the natural numbers, well, I've got all of compute inside the natural numbers. So I haven't built a foundational account. I needed, you know, I needed, I, I already needed that. I, I needed compute in order to describe compute. There's no progress. Mm. I see. Right. So, uh, so, so what I said was, well, look, since, since we're, since we're saying you need compute to describe compute, well, let's just embrace that idea. So <laughs> mm. make the names come from whatever the, whatever the thing is that you're doing compute with. Don't, don't run away from it. <laughs> and, and I, I realized now uh, how, um, uh, how uh, unforgeable names uh, are really, uh, if, if they are put inside the terms, they're creating uh, uh, another unique names. They, yes, that's they, correct. I mean, they, that's they're right. just generated. Like that's if you right. have the hole inside and you put uh, some unforgeable name, this yeah. is an, uh, another like unique unique name. So, yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, 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 now that, now looks much simpler. <laughs> oh yeah, and, and and see the thing the thing that's really beautiful is that now you have you can you have um, tools for making local statements about. Um, about reachability and visibility and conflict. So, for example, you know that a name uh, without certain um, recursive operators, a process can never mention a name that mentions that process. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, so, you, so you know, you know, given a process, you can you know how to construct a name that's fresh with respect to that process. Mm, yeah, right. You just quote the process and and off you go right it's it's it, you know that that name is separate from all the names in that process yeah, so, nice. so 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 this this the, the the main point is that you can guarantee through local operations global and global properties right this name is separate from that process from all the names in that process yeah, so more precise mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, so, so can, can, I, can I ask you just a, a, a one question that, uh, connected to that? So is it possible that uh, we can uh, now in, in Arnold we are, we are using a, a random generator with, uh, with a seed. Uh, can we do this uh, if we have only some kind of sequential uh, generator without uh, because now, now I, I see unforgeable names or, or, or these generated names as a sequence, but with sequence inside. Like, well, it has to be splittable, right? Every time you have a yes. par, you have to be able to split. Uh, and I, I was thinking, is this really necessary, or uh, can we syntactically uh, decide this, uh, uh, like, before executing? So we so so we can escape escape uh, uh, of 
Oh, well, for, for some for some classes and programs, yes. But, you know, that you're right up against the halting mm. problem. Oh, I see. I see. Oh. So I, I was thinking about that and uh, uh, Leslie Lampert, uh, 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 he was uh, uh, talking about timestamps. So I, I, I was imagining that uh, his timestamps are uh, really sequential without this uh, splittable. Yeah but, the, 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 yeah, but what you're saying then is you have a global ordering of all events. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Mm. Yeah, Timestamps. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. this is the point I've always argued with, with, with Lamport. L Lamport doesn't, doesn't, like, like there, is, there is no compositional um, clock. Right. If there was a compositional mm -hmm. clock, then um, then uh, you'd find it in general relativity. But you don't. The issue is that there are there are regions of space that are separated by uh, um, space like distance. So there's no causal ordering. Right. This is this is it's just a it's a fact of reality that we have to come to terms with. There are events which are not causally ordered with respect to each other. And you want that to be the case because otherwise you can lay everything out in some gigantic global sequence. So is it somehow this uh, splittable way uh, of generating uh, these names has some kind of correlation with that? Because That's this correct. seems like a... Like a like... The, split, the splitting of the namespace, the splitting of the namespace gives you non-causal ordering. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm, cool. Because uh, otherwise, if you if you had a generator, your generator would be your clock. I see. I see. Yeah, this makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for for. No, no. These, these are these are great questions. They're very useful. But now, now we're starting to see <laughs> some of the advantages of the architecture. Right? The architecture allows you to reason about these things cleanly and 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 precisely. Right. So now we can we can say things that other other architectures they can't even begin to articulate. Right. It's, they can't say them. We can not only say them, we can reason about them, and we can say, you know, what gains you will get. All right. Um, so, see, see, folks over in the uh, the, the dev stand up. Thanks for a, a, a stimulating conversation today. Thank you. See yeah. You. Thank you. All right. See you. Bye.